Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second Appendix 4C reporting wrap event of the week. Uh, welcome back to anybody who joined us on Wednesday morning or indeed any of our regular uh, Coffee Microcaps morning meeting attendees. My name is Mark Holman. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps, and I'm just going to quickly run through some basic housekeeping slides, and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. Uh, in terms of companies presenting at this event, and indeed the Coffee Microcaps morning meetings events, they're generally, for anybody who's joining us for the first time, generally we look at companies with a market cap of under 300 million, companies which are in revenue and approaching cash flow break even, or indeed are, are already profitable. Uh, we don't have companies from the resources or biotechnology sectors. Uh, so it's a mix of what I would call industrial microcaps, which is microcap technology companies, financial services companies, uh, niche retailers, or hardcore industrial products businesses. And uh, so quite a mix, even if we exclude the resources in the biotech sectors. Uh, structure of this morning's webinar, we've got four companies presenting over the space of the next two hours. Each company presents uh, in a 30 minute slot, which is gonna be roughly broken down into a 20 minute presentation and 10 minutes of Q&A. Uh, if you do have any questions for our presenters, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. Just makes it easier for myself to moderate the questions to our presenters. Uh, please note the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel on Monday morning. Uh, you can also catch the recording of Wednesday's event on the YouTube channel and indeed recordings of all our other previous morning meeting events, which now number 40. And you can follow Coffee Microcaps on Twitter, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn. I also write a weekly uh, subscription newsletter, which you can get on the Substack platform where I profile one interesting microcap stock every week. Uh, we are going to be crossing to New York for Mr. Eddie Geller from Tiny Beans in a moment. After that, then it's back to Sydney and we're delighted to be joined by George Lucas and Brendan Malone from Rays. We will then have uh, Rob Edgeley, who is actually a returning presenter, uh, the non-executive chairman of Self Wealth presenting. And then finally, we'll be crossing back to the US to San Diego. We have Mr. Mark Schneider, president and CEO of Zbit Incorporated. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I know that uh, Eddie is patiently waiting for us late Friday evening. Uh, sorry, late Thursday evening, his time in uh, in New York. Eddie, if you want to start sharing your screen. Sounds great. Yeah, it's coming up now. How's that? Yeah, perfect. Looks good, Eddie. Fantastic. Well, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Eddie Geller, CEO of Tiny Beans Group. Um, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me at this event. Obviously, a real pleasure to be invited to uh, speak to um, you, know, you and your members. So um, for those of you that don't know um, about Tiny Beans, um, I'll provide a bit of an overview of who we are. And then I guess for those of you that know us, yeah, this should serve a bit of an update if you were on the earnings call a few days earlier. So really exciting time for the company. We're really um, you know, growing quarter on quarter, year on year. And really, we think we have a phenomenal opportunity to really drive this parenting space in the US and really all over the world in years to come. So before uh, I sort of get into more of the specifics, I'd love to kick off with a very short video um, to provide a bit more of an overview of who we are. Hope you enjoy.
big tiny beans fans because we get to upload as many photos and videos of our kid while keeping his privacy private. I get so many incredible emails from my family thanking me for taking the time to upload those pictures. It's just like one step every day where I can relive the happy times we had. Hopefully that presented a bit of a picture and an overview of who we are in case you hadn't heard of us um, before. So, um, you know, like all companies, it's really important to understand who the team is, who the leadership team is that you're, I guess, banking on and, um, you know, driving this company forward. And really, I'm just really excited that um, we've created this team over the last 18 months um, based all in New York to really take the company from where it is today to really, we believe, you know, billion dollar plus in years to come. I'm not going to go through all the wonderful people here in front of you, but the brands below really represent, you know, where these people have come from, from Chris, our CFO, who joined a few months ago at NBC Universal Viacom, to Nina, Chief Revenue Officer from great brands like Condé Nast and Wall Street Journal, um, Alison Muskman, our CMO, um, used to run Amazon Prime now, and Meredith, the People Magazine subscription business, so all subscription is really her forte, and Mark and Kyle, we worked, you know, worked with great brands at Kickstarter, Gilt, and QBC. So really phenomenal team that really is all about taking what we have today, more importantly, moving it forward. So I thought it'd be worthwhile giving you some context as to who the team is. Really, we believe um, you know, all-star talent to obviously take this company forward and build something truly special. So when we say build something truly special, it's really in a massive market. So there's a huge market in parenthood. I mean, there's $100 billion, $110 billion spent in advertising. You know, there's so much to spend in parents. Um, if you think about the, the, the money spent in goods with kids and, and um, children and toys every year in the US, it's over a trillion dollars itself. It's just a huge market. And globally, you know, obviously your baby's born everywhere. And then also um, um, the key target, I guess, consumer is a millennial and they wake up with a device, they go to bed with a device. And really for us, it's about servicing them with a whole range of different, um, I guess, products and experiences that really drive them and really can create the sort of the go-to space for all things parenthood. And I just wanna say before I, I sort of go further to explain more is that this entirely white space, there is no brand synonymous with parenthood. And we believe we are the brand to create that to really be this connection of when parents think about, you know, anything to do with helping, solving, engaging, finding about their kids and parenthood, they're going to start with Tiny Beans. And really, we believe we have a wonderful brand today, and we're going to fill the void and lead the market in this space. So Tiny Beans at a glance. So really the business is finishing up a wonderful year. And I just want to sort of also say for the record that all the numbers I'll share with you here in US dollars 100% of our revenues are in the US. So it just made sense to report these on US dollars. We've had a wonderful year. We want a July to June financial year. We've doubled the business in the last 12 months. And it's just been a wonderful year in terms of not only I'm growing out the, uh, the audience and the engagement, which I'll talk about in a minute, but also the fact that the revenue has really grown in really was a difficult 2020 calendar year with a lot of brands pulling back. But really, we've seen brands really leaning into 2021 and investing significantly. So there's a really, I'd say, a booming ad market at the moment. And you've probably seen all the other big globals really deliver wonderful results. And I think we're also a beneficiary of that. But even outside of the advertising business, we've had a wonderful year in terms of just partnerships. Apple has been a wonderful partner. We're the exclusive parenting content provider in Apple Guides and really in top five in terms of engagement and other sort of wonderful metrics in terms of over the last 12 months, we now uh, engage over 1,300K plus partners in advertising, you know, up from five the previous year. So if you have a question around what type of concentration do we have in terms of you know, um, brands we work with, how much we're spending, is there any risk around that? It's a really a, a wonderful, um, you know, I guess, experience with these brands in multiple different industries. So we're not tied to any one brand or handful of brands in a certain industry if there is a downturn or anything like that. So really coming off a wonderful year and 
but really it's really a basis for what's to come. There's a huge amount we're still going to create. The one thing that's important to share is that from a strategy perspective, we're really focused on building a business around multiple revenue streams. So today about 85% of revenue comes from advertising, work with wonderful brands like Lego and Amazon and Google to name a few, and about 15% comes from consumer revenues. Um, earlier this year, we've set a strategic imperative that in the next couple of years, we wanna be that 50-50, 50% advertising, 50% consumer revenues. So really this chart is illustrative of our strategy around building out the platform to not only accelerate growth in advertising, but really we feel build a very compelling experience and a revenue stream around consumer. So for example, it's 85-15 today, 85 advertising 15. In order for us to get to 50-50 in the next couple of years, you should definitely expect that to change this year. So fully expect the advertising to continue to grow, but also continue to sort of be a smaller percentage over the total revenue stream and we'll see consumer revenue really scale. And that's gonna be driven by subscriptions, largely, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then other, serving, other services below, you know, above that later on. But this is a really important slide to appreciate the fact that we're building a business that has complementary revenue streams, advertising and, and subscriptions and consumer fully can be woven in together. And I'll explain that a little bit more later on, but really it's an exciting you know, strategy for us and really we feel will be very compelling. From product strategy perspective, some of you that may know Tiny Beans were often, you know, I guess, connected to memories, private sharing, parents connecting with, you know, um, with their family members around everyday memories of their kids. Through tailored content and content through an acquisition we made last year called Red Tricycle, we really have a wonderful platform for inspiring everyday content, creating content in markets all over the country to really engage with parents at all, you know, with all sorts of aged children. What we're also building out is a whole community experience where parents can connect with parents at all sorts of different um, ages and stages. Parents with twins finding parents with twins, dads of four boys like me finding dads of four boys. And that's something also launching this year. So our product strategy is really around creating this must have experience for parents. You'll see a huge upgrade, a huge reinvention of the experience calendar Q4. So it'll be between October to December quarter. So all the things you see today, maybe on the, on the app, of Tiny Beans or the website of Red Trial, Tiny Beans is all going to be folded into an experience related this calendar year. So really, it's an exciting time. And our goal is that Tiny Beans is as must have a subscription experience when you want to have anything to do with, with your kids, where they're going to be starting with us. And that's really where we're heading is about creating this experience where most parents in the world start with Google for answers or maybe Facebook for, uh, for connection we really you know, believe that there's an opportunity to own the space in terms of parenthood to really be with Tiny Beans. So just digging in a little bit more about the numbers for the year. So as I said, in the last 12 months, we've doubled the, the, the business. We've gotten to over 8 million US, about 11 million Aussie over the last 12 months. That's broken down by the advertising revenue stream being about 85%. Subscriptions, we're a small subscription business today under the memories experience. And then we also have some supporting e-commerce and printing. And they're really supporting e-commerce. We see a significant opportunity to the future, but for now it's relatively small. It's basically just the transactional based revenue, but definitely we feel that growing into 2022 and beyond. But for us, it's about over the last 12 months, we've been investing significantly in these new product initiatives. And I'll talk about them shortly that really feel we'll start to get returns on that. And we have already to a degree, but will be much more over the next 12 months. Here are some key metrics that we thought the market would really benefit by just to understand some really leading indicators for the potential growth and opportunity of the, of the revenue stream and the, the company. So, so, so here in front of you, a whole bunch of your metrics around um, the advertising business. You can see we've grown across the board. Ad revenue partners, over 100K we've grown. Proposals of 100K is incredible. We did 15 last 12 months through FY20. FY21 was 95. So just to show you the seat at the table where we're having brands inviting us to be part of their, their campaign, their strategy and be included. And for the first time ever, we've submitted a couple of proposals over a million dollars. And again, you know, for us, it's exciting because we're now being introduced to these brands. Brands are coming back for more campaigns. They're increasing their spend. And the new brands are seeing the value of other brand campaigns and obviously approaching us. And obviously across the board, whether it's number of brands, brand deal size, advertising 60-day pipeline, purely just a snapshot measure we thought the market would benefit by. 
to give you a sense of the health of the business. So although there is excitement anticipation with the subscription business we are going to launch later this year, we definitely want everyone to appreciate we have a growing and thriving um, business around advertising. And that's going to continue to grow year on year out because we have a wonderful value prop to brands. And we wouldn't be having these brands we have today without the, the delivery of goals we obviously deliver across all their campaigns. This gives you a bit of a, you know, uh, I guess more detailed sense of the business quarter on quarter, and we really have wonderful momentum. Um, so given it's advertising, you know, um, style revenue stream, which is the, the dominant revenue stream, it, it is a seasonal based business. So you can see some of the seasonality come into play in that chart that the Q1 calendar year or Q3 in the financial year is, is typically the weakest quarter. Um, and that's because brands typically run a calendar year budgets. They're typically basically just starting off their planning and their campaign for the year. So typically, it's a smaller quarter, which is fully expected. And they, the, the holiday period is typically the biggest one. You can see that's usually Q2. Having said that, we had a record quarter we just finished, and it beat our, uh, our previous record of the holiday quarter, which just gives you a sense as to how well we're doing and how brands are benefiting by it. You see some of the brands at the bottom. It's a wonderful position to sort of you know, have this I guess this roster of brands. And just to I'm dig into some of them, we've had great wins with brands like Google came back for more, Church and White was a new brand we won. Visit Victoria is a new brand we'd won, which basically demonstrates how the travel and tourism industry is coming back to life in 2021 after clearly a significant hiatus in 2020. And we've started to win other campaigns and other brands through that because parents and families want to travel. We have a wonderful audience. They want to be able to be recommended where they should be traveling and how based on all sorts of different you know, insights. And that's something that's really powerful. And then the Hills Pet Nutrition was a wonderful um, partnership we, we won a few months ago. And that's where we added pets to the platform. Happy to answer questions about that later, but pets are now part of the experience. Pet parenting is part of the experience too. And then from an audience perspective, we had 4.3 million monthly actives, about 60% year on year. And just one comment on that is that the entire audience has been acquired organically, meaning zero spent on paid acquisition, zero spent on advertising and marketing. So the fact that we grew in the year in audience, given all that was organic, it is really you know, a telltale sign. Having said that, we do plan in this new fiscal to really step it up and start to invest in some of the um, marketing and advertising and paid media. So that'll be off the back of the launch of the subscription and new brand coming up in, in the Q4 calendar year. Cash burn was also really good. We only burned over 300,000 um, in US dollars um, and the cash position is, is, is also, also, also very solid. It gives you a view of, of how many quarters we have comfortably of cash, especially as revenue continues to grow. So affordable contracts is another one where you can sort of see the full health of business. So really we're in a wonderful position. We've got wonderful tailwinds into this coming you know, FY22 and really I think we're only just beginning. From a financial perspective, um, this really demonstrates some of the, uh, I guess, the, the, um, the lower end financials of the EBITDA line. We have a significant investment in a whole range of new offerings. Um, and, we've, and we've here, um, I guess, uh, summarized it through growth investments. And guess what this chart is trying to represent is that if we didn't want to invest in new revenue streams, it would be easily profitable today. But we feel there's so much growth across the audience we have the assets we've created, more importantly, the opportunity in the market, we're doubling down and investing further into, into future revenue streams and to the platform and into the, obviously the market of parenthood. So all sorts of services like a new web platform, we're launching new services around personalization of content and community I touched on before, and really to stay tuned for a lot of that launch later this year. And one thing I'm really excited about is that all the numbers and all the financials that we've been able to deliver the last 12 months have really been based on a, an older platform that we, that we launched years ago. So the fact that we're growing based on that older platform, which, all, which basically gives you some really you know, exciting comfort that you know, once we launch this new platform, there's just so much more upside in the future. So for example, we don't have a video ad product today, but with this updated platform later this year, we'll have a video ad experience where brands can then buy ad experiences through video, for example. So it just gives you a sense is that we're able to generate the success we've had in this platform. You can only imagine what the, what the, what the upside is going to be once this new platform launches later this year. So one thing I just wanted to sort of illustrate on the subscriptions, which is really a big bet for us later this year, but a very, um, uh, I would say, heavily researched, validated bet. We've been testing this for the last six months. So I know it, 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 um, 
this may come across as quite a convoluted slide, but just to sort of unpack a little bit, on the left is really all the components of what we have today in terms of memories, content, and community in terms of a, a beta experience. And what we're launching later this year is a single subscription product around all these relevant services. So it's about a single price, $5 a month, $4 a year. It's going to pack in a lot of different value um, to the parents. So we want them to think that it's a highly valuable that they must have in terms of the experience. That's the, the, um, the solution later this year. And, and just one comment I want to make is that in all the research and all the validation we've done, none of this is all around like, well, if you buy the subscription, you get no ads. Actually, parents and consumers want ads. They just want tasteful and targeted ones. So as opposed to being obnoxious and like if I'm, you know, obviously um, going through a potty training stage with my kids, I don't want to have ads around getting ready you know, for school or if my kids are getting ready for school, you know, ads around potty training, for example. So it's a much more tasteful, integrated experience and that's what we're building out. So as I sort of, you know, wrap up the presentation and, and, uh, and, and obviously open up for questions, we're really in an exciting time for the company. We sort of delivered a wonderful 12 months we sort of built this experience, you know, the, and really this trust experience with, with parents that really trust the brand of what we've been able to create. We have a phenomenal team in place, leadership team I've spoken to, you know, about before that have come in place from wonderful brands to really see what we have today and build out something special. And really, I think, you know, for us, it's about building a brand that lasts generations. And I want to be synonymous with parenthoods. I think as a parent, I can relate to this heavily that there's really nothing out there that's servicing the needs of, of parents for, for us and for anyone, frankly, particularly well. And I think we're in a wonderful position to do that. So um, with that, I'm gonna open it up for questions and I'm happy to answer any of these things or anything outside of it. Cheers, thanks, Eddie. Um, I, I'll maybe kick off with a question or two while we wait for one or two from the audience. Um, in terms of once you have the new platform in place, are you going to look at expanding internationally? I know when we spoke before, you know, a, a lot of it is uh, US subscribers and historical Australian subscribers from where the business started and, you know, expanding into like Europe uh, as a strategy, um, for example, wasn't really on the cards. Do you think after you get the new platform launched that you will start to take the platform more international? It's a great question. So, so what's interesting is that, um, to your point, you know, most of the business is in, is in the US and largely, or most of the revenue is because so much of it is advertising. And really has, we really haven't, have, haven't had a compelling subscription offering to, to, to grow the revenue streams into other markets, frankly. So, and growing advertising other markets mean you need audiences in those markets and then probably a sales team in those markets. So we really haven't had the sort of the, the, the capacity and capability to do that. Having said that, with a subscription offering around you know, memories, tailored content, and then community, where community is very user-generated content, meaning parents post videos, other parents consume those videos, that can be in any country in the world. That can be in you know, communities in Spain, that could be communities all across Asia, that communities in all sorts of different countries without the need to be relying on on, on other things that you need at a local level. So we're really excited by the fact that the platform will not only have a compelling subscription experience for the US or English speaking countries, we'll be able to also go into other countries because so much of it will be user generated too. So um, we, um, we do have plans and I'm not quite sure if it's gonna be next year or the year after around having the content in also in other languages, but we feel that for now, we think that the compelling experience will be across the community side and also the memory side, we feel um, we'll be able to go into other markets too, beyond just the English speaking ones. And then if advertising scales and then the audiences scale to then be able to sell advertising in those markets will obviously follow suit. But that's, so the subscription strategy I think is a key one for us to launch in those markets to then have, first of all, diversified revenue streams, but also the fact that, you know, we have customers everywhere. Okay, great. And then a question on the, the red tricycle acquisition. Um, cool. I know, Buying Red Tricycle gave you um, access to uh, parents of slightly older kids compared to where the, the Tiny Beans customers have been. Have you seen, I guess, that uh, play out where now, you know, parents who kids are kind of slightly older are migrating naturally into the, the, the Red Tricycle uh, arena? 
Yeah, um, I'm a good way question, Mark. So for everyone's benefit, we acquired a company, Red Tricycle, a little over 18 months ago. It's all around wonderful content um, that it services about 60 markets here in the US. In the, in the app experience, we launched um, a whole range of content um, uh, for the, the users of Tiny Beans. It was in the, in the form of what's called a today screen. So when you open up the app, you have all this tailored content and that content would be served up from Red Tricycle. So the engagement was very good actually. Um, and it was very it was very well received and very well engaged. Um, and, and that was actually, you know, you know, one of the many reasons why we felt where we had to have an integrated platform to, you know, to, to basically not only take the um, the users from um, tiny beans into red tricycle, but also red tricycle into tiny beans. Um, so as we build out this platform launching later this year, you'll see a completely integrated experience. It won't be where you, you basically open up memories and then you have to go to this other area for content, it will be completely woven in and integrated. So the content will be part of the experience. So to your point, Mark, a parent of a two-year-old will see content that actually was created by a tricycle, although you won't realize that. Or, uh, you know, if you've got a nine-year-old that, you know, you're not engaged in the app for memories, you're engaged in the app around content that's being created. So we're definitely... I'm spending a lot of time and energy around that integration experience, not only from a content, but also from a user experience about how you engage in the app and the web from content to, uh, to memories and then obviously launching community as well um, and bringing those three worlds together. Because to your point, when the, you, you may have a, have a 10 year old, you're not gonna be adding photos every day, but you still wanna be consuming content. You still wanna talk to other parents that have a 10 year old. And there's some of the other features that we feel with a really nice user experience, we'll find compelling reasons where the parents are engaged on a daily and weekly basis. Okay, great. And then possibly a final question, uh, other acquisitions in, in the future? Um, I, I know you said there, you feel that there's a lot of white space there and, and Tiny Beans is, is the leader in the space. Is there, uh, is that part of the, the kind of 12 to 18 month strategy uh, where uh, something else could be integrated into the into the new platform, but you would have to maybe buy a hin rather than develop yourself? Or is it completely internally focused at this point? Yeah, it, it's a great question. I mean, for now, um, Mark, we're very focused on just, on just implementing the uh, um, this new platform strategy and launching that. Having said that, I think in the next 12 to 18 months, I'd love to explore acquisitions. You know, at the moment, um, the, the highest priority for me is probably e-commerce. I think there's many e-commerce sites that serve parents that have not got the audiences to really grow them, but they've solved the problem for drop shipping and e-commerce experiences and tailoring products for you know kids at a certain age and stage. And I feel that potentially, um, acquiring a company that has that and solve the problem of customer service and merchandising and dropshipping and logistics, plugging that into our platform could be really beneficial. But I don't see that probably for about 12 months or so, maybe 18, hard to sort of say, but I see that probably as the, as the, as the next extension of the platform because we have all these parents and we have all this data on them because they've given it to us. It's about trying to grow and ensuring we can grow the average revenue per user. So it's gonna start at $5, but frankly speaking, I definitely have a goal that, you know, there's no reason why that can't be 20, 50, $100, um, you know, per, per year, if not per month in the future, because we know how much a parent spent on their kids. And we think e-commerce is next, um, is next for that. Beyond that, there could be all sorts of services. I want to find a babysitter. I want to find a, a speech therapist. I want to find, you know, a dance class. So services as well. But we feel from an acquisition perspective, e-commerce is probably going to be a key one, but we'll see, right? There's always changes in, in the sort of ecosystem that may present other opportunities, but that's the one that comes to mind first. Okay, great. Um, Eddie, I think we'll leave it there. We're like just up on, on time now. And I know that George and Brendan have just joined us and they're standing by. So I'll let you go, as I know it's uh, quite late in the evening there, New York time. And thank you very much for, for uh, coming and joining us again to uh, this morning Sydney time uh, Thursday evening your time and I see Brendan and George are about to start sharing their screen now I can see the appendix 4c now um, Brendan and George so thanks uh, so much Mark I I'll drop off thanks a lot okay Appreciate thanks Eddie the thanks everyone bye-bye uh,
and we can start now with uh, George or Brendan, uh, whichever one of you wants to kick off, we're ready on this side. Cool, thanks Mark. It's um, George here, I'm the Group CEO and Managing Director of Raise Invest, and I've also got Brendan Malone with me, who's the Australian CEO and the Group and the group CEO, sorry for the silly titles, but what, it's good to have titles for the um, Australian operation and the group. And we're going to give you a quick rundown, starting off with a very quick overview of what RAISE is. And then we'll go through um, what we've achieved and not only this quarter, but over you know the last four or five years and um, where we see we're going to go in the future. Um, so the RAISE app was first introduced in the Australian market in 2016. Um, in partnership with a US company called Acorns. Acorns is an unlisted company at the moment, but it will list in the US either late this year or early next year through one of those backdoor SPAC listings. So that will be quite interesting because we'll have another price point in the market of where um, companies like ours you know, with large description models and financial services um, should be tra trading. Over that time period, over five years, we've onboarded um, you know, over 500,000 customers in Australia. And globally, we've had over, you know, we're approaching 2 million signups onto the Raise app. But Brendan will um, talk um, through that. So we were very surprised um, how popular the Raise app was um, in Australia and, you know, driven by this concept of roundups, of being able to save and invest your virtual loose change and this instant appeal. And as I said, we've, you know, we've had over 500,000 Australians use us at some stage in the last five years. We, um, in 2018, we rebranded from Acorns to Raise, and we also listed on the ASX. You know, many of our customers who joined us in 2016 remain extremely active and loyal today. And even though we're seen as a millennial um, appeal with high appeal to millennials, and you know, there's no doubt with um, nearly 90% of our database under 40, um, we, um, uh, we do have strong millennial appeal. We also have appeal, you know, we have 85 year olds using our application. We have 18 year, year olds using our application. We have people who have got balances of $300 and are growing their balances to their, the average mark, you know, balance of two and a half thousand dollars. But we also have people with over $1.2 million sitting on our platform at the time. So we actually have a very large appeal, even though we are seen in the market as very millennial focused. So Raise is and always has been at the core, a platform that allows you to invest your loose change or basically invest small amounts on a very regular basis. But you know, we have also grown from this core of where people could just invest from anything from $5 up. And with, we offer a lot more today and we offer a lot more um, products and services and investment options. So there are two prongs to our strategic growth in the Australian market. Um, and we've successfully grown revenue per customer by continuing to expand this product range and services, not only to include raise super and raise rewards, but we've also got um, um, custom portfolios. We also introduced the Sapphire portfolio, which has an exposure to Bitcoin, et cetera. So we continue to add products which generate higher revenue per customer. And that's one of our strategies, not only here in Australia, um, but um, globally. Um, so we offer about eight options um, when you invest into the core product. Five funds are, um, range from aggressive to passive. And when we, um, which have done quite well, they tend to beat their benchmark over three year period. We've also added an ESG focused portfolio called the um, um, Emerald portfolio, which is our seventh, which is our sixth portfolio. And that was um, driven by customer demand to add a new portfolio. We then added Sapphire portfolio, which is the portfolio that has an exposure to Bitcoin. And it's probably about one of the only mutual funds or you know, retail funds in the world, which allows an exposure to Bitcoin in them. And then recently we added custom portfolios, which is a, which is, um, a choice of 14 ETFs or Bitcoin. And you can basically build your own portfolio and weight your portfolio, whichever way you want. And we're looking to expand the choice of um, ETFs in that. This strategy of adding products and services to grow revenue per customer reflects our focus on becoming a diversified financial services company, a general, a general alternative to the traditional financial institution. 
So the the way rays work, we have this, you know, we have from day one, we've recognized that we have have to be very totally committed to customer service. And we have a very genuine service model and we are highly ranked in the market um, for our customer service, both here in Australia and overseas. And this customer service generates a lot of feedback, which I've mentioned before, generates a, um, a lot of product development and an ability for us to deliver products that our customers um, are one. We began our journey into Southeast Asia with Indonesia, where we've been operating since 2019. And in Malaysia in 2020, um, we set up there in, and we were extremely fortunate to have a joint venture partner with PMB. PMB is not very well known in Australia. One of its subsidiaries, Maybank, um, is more well known in Australia. But T PMB is a very well, very large respected um, fund manager um, with a very similar mandate to raise in Malaysia and manages well over 100 billion Australian dollars worth of assets. We recognize, you know, Southeast Asia represents an enormous opportunity with this large established population of very technical literate young people and fast growing economies and, and fast growing classes. So we're seeing a lot of people moving up into the consumer slash middle class in these economies. And recently we just opened our office in Thailand. We have a staff member in Thailand and we've started the software development to introduce the app into Thailand. And we've also began investigating, um, introducing um, into um, Vietnam. So these business models in Southeast Asia will replicate Australia. Um, we'll be in both Malaysia and Indonesia, we're working hard to increase the revenue per customer and accelerate the revenue growth faster than our customer growth. Um, and Brendan will go through in a little bit more detail how quick our customer growth is um, in these countries. Indonesia is a unique market that is growing at a significant pace. The fact that we have a license and a footprint in the capital of Jakarta has, you know, helps us attract these strategic partners and these relationships. It's very important to have a footprint there. And even though, you know, unfortunately, these countries are being hit quite hard at the moment by the um, COVID pandemic, we're still um, being able to operate at full speed in these countries. The other beauty about our PNB partner is that it, it has a very large footprint, you know, either through Maybank or other subsidiaries into Southeast Asia. And we're working with them when we're expanding into Thailand and Vietnam. So we're not going into Thailand and Vietnam completely alone. And that helps de-risk the proposition for us. So in five, in the five years or so that we've been operating, um, we've delivered, we believe, impressive growth, just not in active customers, but also in revenue. Um, and also in farm, and we've had we've got a target for ourselves to be at a billion dollars worth of farm by the end of this calendar year. We're sitting at roughly eight hundred and seventy million at the moment, and so we're very comfortable within the next six months that we should hit this one billion um, fund market. We obviously have a very strong brand in the market now, and I think that's coming through. And you know we're confident that we can deliver on our growth strategy, not only here in Australia, but also um, in, in Southeast Asia. So after that, I hope that's a brief overview. It gives you a little bit of a rough idea of our corporate profile and our strategy. I'll hand it over to Brendan to um, go through some more detail of what we released to the market um, earlier this week. Great, thank you, George. Uh, morning, Mark, morning all. Uh, so yeah, let's, uh, let's, we did release our uh, Appendix 4C and quarterly activities report on Wednesday morning to the ASX. So we'll just, we'll just quickly unpack that. Um, on the screen, we can see the investment highlights. I will go through them, um, add a bit more colour, and, and George will chime in with anything that uh, I may miss or any other relevant points. So sort of at a higher level, Ray's achieved uh, record results for the quarter. Um, we do, lodge quarter, we do lodge monthly key metrics, sort of five to six days after the month end, to make it very transparent and clear on where we are with our business, but also looking at two, two, of the, two of the key metrics that we have, which is both active customers or customers in general, but also our funds under management. Uh, the third key metric that we, we look at now on a quarterly basis and yearly and half yearly is our revenue. So Raise, raise achieved record global active customers and funds under management for the quarter. We also re recorded revenue uh, with a normalised revenue for the RAISE platform up 76.7% year on year to 3.6 million. Um, global active customers were up 86% or 87% year on year to 456,000. 
at the end of June. Uh, and then our superannuation, uh, sorry, our Australian FUM was up 76% and our super fund was up 53%, giving us a funds under management number of just shy of, of 8 million if you round it up from the 7.799.6 uh, million. Uh, what we're very happy with and George touched on was the continued growth, especially not only in the Australian market, which is our home market, but also Indonesia and uh, Malaysia through this COVID pandemic. And we can see that um, both active customers and in Malaysia and Indonesia are up over 10% for, for the last month ending to 30 June. And we're looking forward to releasing some more, continue this momentum and release some numbers mid next week um, on the ASX. Um, on a, on a cash flow basis, you know, there's, not, there's not many startups out there or businesses like ours that are cash flow positive. Uh, we are very pleased to announce that we were cash flow positive, just shy of half a million Aussie dollars for the quarter across the group, with the Australian business in particular delivering a, a $1.4 million cash, positive cash flow for the quarter. Um, the quarter was very active for us on a not only an operational and, and front end with the customers, but also a corporate, uh, corporate piece. Uh, for the business, which uh, we agreed to acquire Super Estate, which I'll touch on in a bit later, but we also delivered um, a capital raise in the month and also had two in the quarter, sorry, and also two or three new products released in Australia. Um, with that capital raise, we're very we're in a very strong position at 30 June uh, with 19.4 million dollars on the um, on the balance sheet uh, across the group, uh, but also in particularly the cash flow positive gen um, generating businesses that we have today. Anything to add on the investment highlights for the quarter, George? Um, not really. I think one, you know, we've always had an internal goal that it's not growth at any cost and that it's about, you know, growth, but also being cash flow positive. And that's our big, hairy, audacious goal, I guess, from a very high level was to be able to grow at the rate we've been able to grow, but also to come out cash flow positive. And um, so I, from a, you know, from a uh, managing director, CEO, I'm very proud of what our team has been able to do to get you know 1.4 million you know cash flow positive in Australia, while we can still grow our revenue, grow our farm, and grow our active customers at you know a reasonable rate, but not growth at any cost. Yes, I think that that is key. That, that marketing or the cost of acquisition that we deliver would you could say it's well beating. You yeah, know, it's, it's up there in the best. We are, we are. Well, we've been written. We get written up about how we can acquire it, and at the moment, about sixty. To seventy percent of our customers are actually not paid. They're from uh, from organic growth channel, and we've done a lot of research and a lot a lot of work to be able to acquire customers from organic growth channels. Yes. Um, great. So what we'll do now is we will just move the screen up a bit just to show some graphs. Uh, as you can see, there is the there is the growth rates over the, over the life since sort of February sixteen when we launched here in Australia. So I think what I'd like to mention here is that. The Australia business is, is five years old, but the, both the Indonesia and Malaysia business are a couple of years behind, probably just coming up to 18 months, two years on Indonesia, but just over 12 months in, in Malaysia. Uh, so those, both Indonesia and Malaysia are where, where the Australian business was back sort of on these graphs a long time, a few years ago. But the operational or, or even the CapEx costs of going to these businesses well managed, as you can see from our cash flow. Um, so... We, we put our head down while the growth in the customer numbers are sitting anywhere from uh, four or 5% across the group to 10% in both Indonesia and Malaysia. We are continuing to increase our revenue drivers or, or, or the global revenue 60%, whereas something like the customer numbers are for the 12 months uh, are up 80%. So, I mean, we're running the business quite well from that point of view. And what that does remind me is that of, of our financial, the type of platform that we are against some, some of the other market movers out there as in growth rates where people, where other customers and financial transactional businesses are growing customer are growing revenue on a customer basis. So one of our goals is running through the, um, is to increase our revenue per customer. And the run rates for the quarter were just, we're just near, we're close to $50 per customer. And we have a, we have a plan and a structure to get, deliver, to increase that revenue per customer over the next 12, 18 months. Um, I think to just to break down our revenues and, and the way that we've structured the business is to make sure we have multiple revenue streams in, in, across the platforms uh, in case there's anything that happens. So as you can see, we've got four different streams, maintenance fees, account fees, advertising and netting. 
Uh, all these numbers are broken out in our investor decks that are on the ASX. If, if anyone's got any questions or would like to see further information. So in the quarter, we're very, uh, I touched on the acquisition of Super Estate, uh, which is a niche uh, superannuation provider in Australia here that has an asset class that we do not have. The acquisition will improve, will provide uh, the raised group with IP to use this new asset class of residential properties. As George mentioned, we, have, we offer eight different portfolios. One of those portfolios is a customised portfolio where an individual or a self-managed super fund can uh, weight their own portfolio with 14 ETFs quoted here on the ASX, plus Bitcoin and soon to be residential property. So uh, we, we see this as a, as a strategic acquisition for the group, which is our first acquisition. And I was very happy to announce that we closed that yesterday uh, and bringing the two teams together is very positive going forward. Uh, Super Estate brings about 6,000 customers and about $70 million worth of FOM onto our platform in superannuation. Um, and it also has a, a, a business called Vali, which is a property data and technology platform, which will complement recent product developments in Australia, including our raised home ownership. And that Vali database has more than 13 and a half million property valuations. Um, and is key for the key for both the residential fund that, that Super Estate brings, but also the, the Australian product suite through RAISE. So um, I might just quickly talk about um, the capital raise. We did a capital raise um, during the quarter um, where we raised 10.4 million. On top of that, um, we, um, the joint venture, we recapitalized the Malaysian operation, which saw the joint venture partner put $650,000 in. So we still remain 70, 30% ownership in our joint venture in Malaysia. We now believe there's enough capital in there for the operation to run for another 24 months. Um, it's well on its way to being cash flow positive. Um, and so, you know, by the end of the 24 months, we should be starting to see a quite a good cash flow positive business over there. It's growing um, at the rates that we expected, if not higher than expected. Um, the 10.4 million capital raise means that we end up with a balance sheet of roughly 19. Um, million, 19.4 million in cash at the end of the June quarter. So we're very happy with that. Um, from our point of view, we've got enough cash to continue expanding, not only here in Australia, Indonesia, but also into Thailand and um, Vietnam. So we're very happy with our cash position um, at the moment and, um, and the way that um, this was um, achieved. in. In um, Indonesia, we're also in the process of completing um, a joint venture up there with a large um, uh, life insurance company, and hopefully we'll be able to announce to the market soon. And then from that, we will be able to um, start um, issuing life products um, through our platform. Um, and so we've been working very hard, as we've mentioned before, on these strategic relationships not, both, not only in Malaysia, but in Indonesia, which can only be achieved when you're on the ground. I've been personally in Indonesia up to um, June. I've only recently come back and I'll be going back up into Indonesia, Malaysia, probably before the, well before the end of the year. Um, yeah, so I think, that, keep on business, yeah. I think that pretty much covers it. Do you have anything else you want to add, Brendan, before we go to questions? No, I think just a, a very quick summary is that, uh, you know, RAISE is Australia's largest mobile first financial services platform uh, designed to both boost investing, savings and education inside and outside of superannuation. And it's available through the app. So it's a, an iOS and an Android app, but also available on the web app. Um, and just, just for reference, our homepage is www.raiseinvest.com.au. So Mark, we'll hand it over to you for any questions. And thanks, guys. Yeah, we've got a few already, so let's maybe tackle these. Um, I think this is an important one. Um, can you please talk in more detail about the relation to ACORNs in the US? Is it a JV? I think maybe let's just clear up the historical relationship um, straight off the bat on that. Oh, I'll take that one. Um, and that's um, so when, when we started off in Australia, it was a joint venture. When we started off in Australia, it was a joint venture agreement. The joint venture agreement was signed in late 2015. And we, during that time period, um, Australia built its own tech. You know, once the joint venture was signed and the technology was delivered to Australia, from that point in time, the technology was maintained by Australia 
completely alone and also added on to, to by the Australian. So the, by the time that we went our separate ways in 2018, Australia had rewritten about 60 to 70 percent of the stack. Um, when we separated, it was a friendly separation. We have a license with them, a technology license, um, perpetual technology license, um, where we don't pay anything. There's no license fee back to them on that. And we also made an agreement on what markets we would um, we could enter. And we Australia got Southeast Asia, and we agreed that we wouldn't go to the US, etc. Saying that, they also maintain um, an ownership in us. Um, um, around just over six percent. I don't because of the super state acquisition. I'm not 100 percent sure because we just issued new shares yesterday. But it's going to be around six and a half percent ownership. So they're roughly the largest shareholder still in us. Yep. We know from their recent um, presentation for their listing that um, you know coming listing globally. You know expanding globally is one of their three main pillars of what their growth is. And, but they also do have limitations under the licensing agreement of where in the world they can go when they come down to this part of the world. So, um, you know, our, our relationship with them is friendly. You know, we do talk to them occasionally um, because we're the, you know, they're our largest shareholder. So we obviously talk to them, but um, we're not in a joint venture agreement and we do not get their technology anymore and they don't get our technology anymore. Great, great. Thanks, George. Um, you know, yeah. Sorry, Brendan, do you want to add something? No, just make sure that, if there's any other questions question. on that. Yeah. yeah. No, no more questions. Let's let's skip to the next one. And um, what's your? I don't know if you guys disclose this, but their blended cost to acquire a revenue generating customer in Australia. Yeah, that's a very good question. Obviously, it goes up or down, but roughly around eight 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 dollars um, per customer. Look, we've had periods of time where we've been able to do it for less than $4 per customer, and that's actually a paying customer. And we've had periods of time when we've had to do it for more than $15 a customer. Um, but on average, it's probably around $8.50, $8.60 per customer yeah. in Australia. We get lower rates in um, um, Indonesia and Malaysia, but that's for the Australian market. Yeah, great, and that leads nicely into this next question. When you say 67% of customers are through our granny organic growth channels, what does that mean? Maybe just give a bit of color and context between organic and kind of paid acquisition and paid media, paid search. Sure, that's a great, that's a good question. So we don't use, um, we don't use um, SOE pretty much at all. Um, we use platforms like Google and Facebook, which have special advertising platforms set up for advertising apps. And we use those platforms our biggest, our biggest ones are Google and Facebook, but we also use people like um, Imobi or Jingle Mobi, which are also programmatic platforms designed for uh, marketing apps. Um, and they're what we call pay marketing. So we have to pay Google or Facebook for every cost, every um, install, uh, a certain amount of money. Um, and, the, and that install may not turn out to be a paying customer or not. And then, so that's what we call paying paying customers and for organic are the customers who either come through um, a way which isn't paid. So we would include a rep, you know, when I say that 60 or 70%, I would include into that member get member. But at the end of the day, member get member would generate less than five, would only, oh, we call it referrals here, sorry. Um, referrals will only generate somewhere between five to 7% of, um, that, of that organic. So, when I say 60, it's either going to be 53 to 60% roughly again, are coming from word of mouth, um, where we can't link them back to a paid or a paid site. They may have seen a paid ad, but they didn't hit the install button on that pay ad. They came to us some other way. Uh, and I think the word of mouth is, you know, to put it simply is, I will refer, I'll go to a barbecue on the weekend. I'll refer a friend of mine because I may have used something, one of our features like Raise Rewards, which is the program where if you shop with one of our 300 plus merchants, they will put a percentage of your purchase price back into your Raise account. So it's, it creates a, it's a discount, but it's put into a forced savings. So at the Sunday barbecue, I'll be saying, hey, George, look, you know, I've just had a new baby. We bought some baby clothes and we got a reward for it. 
And George goes, well, how'd you get that? What did you do? So you send him a referral link and then George signs up. So it's all, all about the word of mouth. And if you look at something like Raise Central on the, on the Facebook group, we have a very boisterous um, and supportive customer network, which as George said in the beginning, does drive our product development um, and, and, and customer requests what we need to see in the app. Uh, Brendan just said our question or, or George, whoever wants to take it uh, on the back of that. Um, so you're saying five to seven percent of all acquisition is uh, member get member slash referral. Sorry, just will you roughly. just clarify it roughly? Yes, okay, roughly. okay, yeah. perfect. It, it changes every day. It's up and down, but I'm just going to give you averages. Yeah. Yep. Perfect. And then. But you've customers. got to remember that cost is like that, that cost of acquisition is five dollars. So that's really good cost of acquisition. Yeah, which is lower than the eight dollars you referenced earlier. Yeah. Um, so it's a it's a it's a good um channel. It's yeah, exactly. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, a customer lifetime value. Um what, what would oh, that look a, like? Yeah, so this is a very interesting one. Um when we calculate it. We think the life we work out the lifetime value to be somewhere around seven hundred Australian dollars, um, but the more as we get more and more super customers, the lifetime value will increase. Yeah, and so we could easily get to a thousand or more for a lifetime value of a customer. Okay, great. And, and yeah, due to the history of this, I mean we've only been around five years, so we we tend to more look at and report our um, RP or revenue per user. And the last announced one was the it was about twenty three dollars eighty seven for the H two twenty one. But the interesting thing is that the US, when they did the for example, Acorns, when they did their presentation for the capital raise, they use a lot of metrics on how they get their valuation, and I think they were looking at a lifetime value of a customer of roughly just over four hundred US dollars for in the US, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Brendan confirms that I remember okay. Okay. And yeah, then yeah. if you yeah, if, which is US pushing dollars, that, yeah. yeah, that's US dollars. So it's, it's getting very similar to the 700 Aussie dollars. Exactly. Yeah. If you FX it up, uh, it, it's it's in that kind of ballpark. In yeah, terms... and, Australian, and Australians actually use more financial services and pay higher financial services rates than Americans anyway. And the customer lifetime value is that on I'm, I'm assuming that's on a revenue basis not on a on a margin basis obviously right it, no no it's on a um p l type okay. Basis. okay but it is obviously very highly linked to revenue yep and that's so uh, you know you start you start beginning to you know talk about six you know six of one a, do, a dozen of half a dozen of the other but yeah okay and then a question from me, I know there has been kind of regular price increases coming through in the Australian business. Um, should we start to expect the uh, price increases to start flowing through the Asian business anytime in the near future to try and, um, uh, you know, enhance the, the, the ARPU that you get in, um, in the Asian business? Um, so short answer is yes. The long answer is I don't know when, but we are basically following a very similar structure, you know. And again, I'm sorry to keep harping back to this, but we just, for example, saw the US triple their fees last week or this week. Yeah. So some people are now using the Acorns app in Australia, in the US, are paying 15 US dollars a month for it, I believe. And so I know that a lot of people go, oh, $3.50 is very expensive in Australia, but. Um, you know, it's a type similar that, you know, it's compared to the value that they seem to be able to think they can get in the US with quite good value. So we do, in all territories, we do have a lot of opportunities to do fee increases, I believe. Not necessarily tomorrow, but over the long term. Okay, great. And then a final question uh, on Thailand. W should we expect a launch in Thailand in, let's say, FY22? Uh, so sort of, let's say in the next 12 months or is it is it kind of going to be a, a bit longer than that oh so the biggest problem i've got in answering this question is um unfortunately the the pandemic yeah because 
hopefully Thailand begins to open again in August. That's what they're targeting, um, but it may not, um, or it may lock down again, like it did three months ago, where it just went into a harder lockdown. But if the things remain the same, i.e., you know, the pandemic doesn't get too out of control, then we would expect, yes, by the end of FY22. Yeah, I know we are quite a, we are further down the track than I expected based on the current environment than we um, at the moment with Thailand. Yeah, I thought because the pandemic would have slowed us down more, but that hasn't seemed to. Yeah, because, you know, people in Southeast Asia like doing a lot of business face to face, but we seem to have been able to do a lot more business than I thought um, um, online. Okay, great. George, Brendan, uh, we're going to have to leave it there. We are just up on time and I know that uh, Rob is patiently waiting. So if uh, I'm not sure whose screen this is, Brendan, if you could stop sharing your screen. Yes. Okay, great. And then uh, Rob has sent me his presentation. So I'm just going to share it for him now quickly. Okay. Well, we'll just say thanks everyone. And um... Well, we're going to leave. So. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Mark. Thank you, thanks, everybody, for listening. Yeah. Okay, thanks, George. Thanks, Brendan. Thank you. Um, Rob, I've got the cover slide of your presentation up now, so uh, ready to go when you are. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's great to be back on Coffee Microcaps again. Um, I'm uh, hoping that uh, uh, many of you uh, would have viewed the last uh, the last time we were on. So. I try not to have to go through the, the whole business model again. Um, we'll, we'll concentrate on a few um, important things that are happening at Self Wealth. Uh, if you'd like to uh, go through past the disclaimer slide um, to this. Uh, so just uh, the Self Wealth journey um, has been going for a decade now or very close to it. And let's, let's get back to the basics of what we've been doing. Um, we're here to help Australians build wealth. Uh, through our innovative technology, our, trans, our transparent pricing and, and the support for our, neighbors, our members when they, when they need it. So this really um, is the next, we're embarking on the next part of our journey uh, and that is to transform our platform away from a, a, a purely equities uh, transactional platform into a wealth generation platform. So what does that mean? What's the next part of our evolution? Uh, it really means that people are going to be, our clients will be able to spend more and more time in the self-wealth um, uh, eco, uh, ecosystem, and they'll be able to have plenty of um, uh, multiple asset classes that they're able to invest in. Uh, it won't just be equities. And we'll get through through the presentation, you'll see some of the things we have we have planned. So if we just move on to the next slide, please. I'm only re really going to spend little time on this because uh, I'm sure most people on, this, on the call will understand this. Um, so the story, um, we came about uh, in 2012, uh, quickly became Australia's most popular independent online tra trading platform, uh, connecting our clients to various wealth creation tools. Um, price conscious yet high valued mindset. So. We launched the uh, in 2016 uh, for retail investors a $9.50 flat fee brokerage. We're the first flat fee online broker, and we remained that way for the following three years. We're very much uh, can't cannot emphasise enough the fact that we are ASX HIN based and chess sponsored. Um, there are various business models popping up. Um, we believe that uh, all of our clients value incredibly the, ability, the, the fact that they have their own HIN and the stock um, is, is theirs, uh, the beneficial ownership, legal ownership. Um, there's no questions about what may or may not happen. Uh, we have been busy the, in the last six to nine months. Uh, we launched our US trading in December. We had um, very fortuitous timing. Um, the first quarter of, of 2021, saw a blowout quarter, um, an enormous volumes trading, in, especially in the US market, the whole GameStop phenomenon. We couldn't have timed that better to launch. Um, we're, once again, we're $9.50 US, dollar, uh, US dollars for trading. 
So it's the same $9.50 fee. Uh, and we have um, a very uh, attractive foreign exchange um, proposition. So we, uh, again, there's, there's lots of different business models. We chose not to go with zero brokerage because once you uh, trade, uh, US with us, um, we're only charging you for foreign exchange transactions on um, uh, on your movement of money from your A uh, ANZ Australian dollar account into your US dollar wallet. Uh, and you can then do as many trades as you want without any foreign exchange fees, uh, only when you transfer money back and forward into your, um, between your A dollar and US dollar accounts uh, is, is when you are subject to a fee. So very, very, um, competitive proposition and that's uh that took off uh incredibly well in in the in the first quarter of this year we've since launched two new native mobile apps um the old app uh will be closing down soon um so the, the two new apps have been um highly uh regarded and um have had great reviews and just recently in june we launched the ability for parents to be able to um, set up minor accounts, um, invest on behalf of their children and, and start their uh, creation of wealth uh, journey. Something that uh, gets overlooked sometimes is that we also have an advisor platform, um, which uh, yeah, allows uh, those uh, advisors out there who financial planners and advisors who who value the HIN system, similar to us, um, who don't want a custodian model offered by the very big uh, custodian platforms, your Hub24s and your, um, your net wealths of the world, um, or uh, they want to move away from platforms such as, a, for example, a Macquarie wrap or something like that. Um, these guys want, they want HIN, but they also want access to our $9.50 flat fee. $9.50 flat fee means, um, stating the obvious, you know, a $1,000 trade or a million dollar trade, you're still only paying that $9.50 in brokerage. So we move forward to the next slide. And uh, this is, um, I want to spend a bit of time on this. Um, I've really got two, two things to do today. Look back at our quarterly, um, which was released about uh, four weeks ago now, and see what happened in that quarter. And then look forward, um, po post our capital raise, which was conducted um, a couple of weeks ago, and look forward into the future and what the future holds for self wealth. So it's very important that we understand um, what happened in this quarter, uh, the, the June quarter. It followed the blowout quarter um, in March where we'd launched US equities and where global trading of, on, on exchanges was, was really um, significant uh, and, and self wealth share of that had increased um, substantially. So we, um, we, had a, we had the quarter then which during April through June, which I, I guess people had been expecting to, us to have a quarter like this at some stage. Um, growth slowed um, on the back of, I'm gonna say growth, the, the trading volume growth slowed. So after a, a more, than, more than half a million trades in the, in the March quarter, in June, uh, we slipped down to around the 360,000 trades. And the context of that was that um, the ASX volumes themselves were um, lowest in, in more than 10 quarters. Uh, and in amongst the, the low ASX volumes, the retail trading sector, which is our sector, was even slower than the ASX volume. So, so we, we essentially uh, came back, um, our volumes came back with the market. Having said that, um, we were still able to um, post a positive cash flow for the quarter, uh, 140,000, and we were also able to confirm uh, more than a $1 million cash flow from operating activities for the, for the full year in FY21. So um, we've proven to the market now over five or six quarters that we can be uh, cash flow positive and we can run our business at a profit. Um, as we invest over the next couple of um, quarters and the, and, and the next and even further out than that, um, we'll, we will see more um, the potentially negative cash flow quarters, uh, depending on how quick the, inc the increased revenue streams kick in. However, um, what is key about the, uh, the, March the June quarter that we've got in front of us is, I just wanna draw everyone's attention to the, the, our, our really key KPIs. Um, our active trader growth, we still put on 9,195 tra traders in the quarter. So we're closing in on that 100,000 active traders. And, and please everyone remember, we talk about active traders, people who have deposited cash in their ANZ bank account, or they've transferred their stock from another broker onto the self wealth platform. You must have stock to sell or cash to buy before you're an active trader. 
We don't talk in registrations um, or uh, loosely clients where, where people are talking about they've got someone's email address. Um, we're talking about active traders. So 100,000 active traders is, is a very powerful um, uh, proposition, especially when you turn on new uh, asset classes and new products and, and make, those, uh, make those products available to your um, very large uh, user base. Um, we saw client cash, um, and this is another example of what happened during that quarter. It was, it was pretty much the worst scenario. The, the, the market edged up slowly. There was no, in that quarter, there was no corrections. Um, valuations were very high. What did the retail clients do? They took money off the table. Our cash, our cash balances increased from 452 up to 523 million. Um, and our value of our securities on HIN, which is um, the, the stock that our clients own, yes, it increased with the market going up, but it also increased with large numbers of people switching to our platform and, and transferring their securities across. So we went up to the 5.86 billion at the end of June and then we're well over 6 billion now, as you would expect with um, another month of uh, growth. So what, what actually happened? Our trade volumes went down, but our capacity for future business increased substantially. Put simply, we have more money on the platform, we have more stock on the platform, and we have more customers operating on the platform. So um, we're very confident that uh, given, um, especially we're coming into reporting season, a bit more volatility in the markets, um, we'll see a, you know, a pretty good pickup from those levels. Uh, and, and we're just really happy that, um, uh, that we've got the capacity on our platform uh, to continue growing. Now, just um, before I move on to the next slide, just bear in mind that that increase in cash was despite um, at around about $60 million a quarter, uh, oh, sorry, a, a month going, sorry, a quarter going into um, uh, US dollars. So when the 523 does not include the money that was transferred out of people's bank accounts in, onto the US, into their US dollar wallet. So, and then spent in, um, spent or kept in, spent on stocks in the US or, or kept in the US. So we're not counting those US dollar ba balances. So you can see that's extraordinary. Active traders over 100% year on year on growth. That if I had to look at one thing in, on this page, that's what I'd be looking at. Okay, next next slide. Thanks, Mark. Conscious of the time, I've got about eight minutes before questions. Um, uh, here you will see that um, uh, we're investing in growth, um, and that was really um, the reason for our capital raise. Um, we we are looking forward, and we are absolutely gunning for that seventy percent market share that the big banks hold. Now, the bank aligned platforms around the seventy percent market share, and uh, we are not just going to continue on our, um, on our present course uh, that we've been on for the last um, number of years. We're going to step things up considerably. Um, that 70% that market share, make no doubt about it, it is up for grabs. Um, it is up for grabs. We've already seen the ANZ announce uh, they will be uh, selling their uh, online broking platform. Um, and the banks um, really not that interested in wealth management these days, as everyone will realise after the Royal Commission. So um, I don't believe they're getting the investment spend. Um, maybe we maybe we call uh, Comsec the big gorilla in the room. They've obviously got a, a very very big business, but certainly the other banks um, not investing uh, and. and are all operating on legacy platforms, not cloud-based, um, not agile. Uh, we believe we are in a, an extremely strong position to go after that market share. We've been chipping away at it uh, for a number of years and, and we're, we're the, been the recipient of people who want better value and better pricing. But what we need to do now is to um, invest to make our platform at least in parity with in terms of um, functionality and product breadth as the bank platforms who've been around for 30 and 35 years, we need to get there quickly. And that's the, um, the purpose of this capital raise. You'll see there that approximately 50% of funds um, are being spent, will be spent over 18 months um, in a very prudent manner. Self-wealth, um, as you can see by our financial record, um, we're, we're very, um, uh, diligent in the way we go about cost allocation and, and capital allocation. So the, the IT uh, and product, the 50% that's spent on that, that is going to broaden our product offering. 
um, and that's going to uh, allow us to bring that um, to the to the marketplace sooner rather than later. Uh, we have a, an a increase about 25% of funds again over 18 months will go into uh, and more aggressive marketing. Now we we do digital marketing extremely well. I noticed in the last presentation uh, by the Raise guys, they were talking about their digital marketing. We do it very well also. Um, we'll continue to do it well and we'll continue to target the areas that we believe um, uh, are, are, are critical for the increasing addressable market in our, in our industry. But we'll also do a bit more above the line. Um, we need to make sure that everyone who has a bank platform account knows who Self Wealth is, knows that they can trust us and knows that um, that, that they will have a better user experience um, on our platform. Uh, data, we've been sitting on a gold mine of data for the last seven years. Um, we want to make some of that we make available to our clients um, uh, on our platform in the community data, but there's a lot more we can do um, uh, to enable us to ut utilise that data better, allow people to, under to get notifications when they when there's something happening in, their, in the stocks that they're interested. All that stuff's coming. And how is, you know, that we have, um, we, we specifically uh, did a global search for our new CEO, Kath Whitaker, who joined in April. Uh, she is an expert in all of these things. She's executing this plan that's been placed in front of you. And, and uh, as everyone would have seen in the investor presentation, we put onto the, onto the ASX um, uh, a couple of weeks ago around our, our, um, our capital raise. Uh, so Kath joined in April and, and she has um, had an enormous first three or four months uh, and is hitting, uh, hitting the ball out of the park already. Um, so that's going to be, allow us to, to bring to all of our clients uh, the, the increase in uh, functionality. And I'm, I'm going to, in the, in the essence of saving time, I'm going to go over the next slide, which you can look at scalability and diverse, diversification of revenue. And it'll, I'll jump into the, the product because I'm sure most people are interested, okay, where are these, where are these new revenue streams coming from? And, and when, when is this new functionality coming? So let's spend a little bit of time on this product roadmap. This has been put together meticulously. Um, we researched um, over 4,000 of um, our clients um, in an in a external exercise uh, to see what they, uh, what they needed on the Self Wealth platform. We went out and talked to um, around about a thousand clients of, of other platforms as well. And we've put together this product roadmap with a lot of care uh, and we're going to address the things that people need. And this is going to increase our, our, re our revenue streams as well as um, we believe increase the amount of activity on our platform from our current members. So what's happening, uh, quarter one, live pricing. Uh, anyone who has Self Wealth account will know that, yes, you do have live pricing when you click onto a stock and you want to trade, that's live pricing and the depth, everything is live. However, um, we've, we've got a very interactive platform and the live pricing has been 20 minutes delayed through your portfolio and watch lists. Um, we've had successful negotiations with um, all the various price providers and we're now uh, in a position to say that that will be coming in the first quarter, probably in the next five or six weeks, um, uh, I believe. Uh, instant deposits, another thing that has um, frustrated clients for a long time. We're working on that um, with a number of parties and that also is a five or six week time period. Um, they will be uh, two key, key things which um, uh, may have kept some people You've transferred your stock from Comsec or NAB Trade to Self Wealth. You're dealing because you like the user experience and you like the um, the, the nine dollars fifty, but you keep that other machine on because you just want need to see that live pricing oil. Uh, those things, those um, irritations will be removed um, in the next six weeks. User experience on our desktop will be refreshed. Um, uh, we've we've launch the two native mobile apps. Um, they're very good, but we need to continue and we'll continue to refresh those to make sure that the, the experience on mobile, mobile or desktop is, um, is very similar. We'll introduce tax reporting, dynamic notifications. That's the data that we were referring to in the previous slides. And we'll, we'll add to our international markets. Uh, the US market has been a, uh, it was our first um, venture into uh, global markets. Uh, it, it created uh, a new revenue stream in the form of US dollar brokerage. 
it created a new revenue stream in, in the form of foreign exchange revenue. Um, we'll, we have two markets um, uh, that we'd like to move into over the next 12 months. The first one will be later this year, um, and that looks like it's odds on to be Hong Kong. Uh, everyone, we're very excited about that. Our partner, Philip Capital, who uh, provides us all of our um, our data and our access to these global markets um, based in Singapore, uh, very, very strong global investment bank. Um, they are also very excited about, about us going into Hong Kong. Um, as you will know, um, the uh, Chinese technology stocks more and more will be now forced to list through the Hong Kong exchange rather than the NASDAQ given um, uh, recent restrictions placed on them uh, in China. So uh, to take part in those IPOs and to get, get exposure to those stocks, we believe Hong Kong is already showing enormous growth in um, trade volumes. Um, we, we bet that that will continue and we wanna be a part of that. And we will then go on um, in uh, 2022 and add another market, whether it's, um, whether it's a Canada or a UK or um, whatever, that, that'll be decided um, in, in consultation with our clients. Uh, keeping an eye on the client, the, the time as well. Um, one thing that certainly um, our clients have voted with um, in, incredible gusto has been cryptocurrency. So we are trying to uh, get to the point where we can offer um, self-wealth clients access to, in the one portfolio, Australian equities, US equities, other global market equities and Bitcoin, all in the same portfolio. That would be a first for Australian um, Australian online brokers. And uh, we believe that will give us um, a, a very strong first market mover advantage. Now, why are we doing this? Because when we researched our client base, we found that 30% of our clients already hold cryptocurrencies and another 30% saying that they intended to do so in the next 12 months. So once again, um, we are going to monetize um, uh, our clients, um, the value of our clients, get them to spend that money not on other, uh, on other platforms, but on our platform. So obviously we've got a bit of work to do. We have to ensure that um, we have all the appropriate uh, licenses um, or uh, approvals required. Um, we must ensure that, our, uh, that we have a very good custodian model for cryptocurrencies. We won't be doing, um, you won't be doing two or 300 cryptocurrencies on self-wealth. We'll be doing this a self-wealth way. We'll be using education. We'll be uh, making uh, our clients aware of the risks and we'll be putting forward initially probably about five coins. Um, the, the biggest, the most, um, the highest market caps and the ones that uh, most trading occurs in. Uh, I won't go through the rest of those. Um, if we go on to the next slide and we'll get, leave some time for questions. You, you have to know that um, our business is scalable because we've come from 20, 30,000 clients about 15 months ago up to, um, up to you know, knocking on the door of 100,000 now. And our platform has not had a downtime in that. You know, we've had the, the worst you've experienced in self wealth is, is, is a few 15 minute periods of maybe something slowing down. That cannot be said by any other platform in Australia and probably worldwide, to be honest. So I'm, I'm incredibly proud of um, our team for being able to keep our platform uh, as stable as it has been. And it's certainly one of the reasons why people, so many people want to join SelfWealth. Um, yes, we are trusted. Um, we were the first guys to give you the $9.50, the flat rate, no commissions, no, no other fees. We absorb all the bank fees. We pay your bank fees uh, and uh, you don't pay that to the ANZ. We do. Um, so we, we are trusted and, and the word of mouth, um, word of word of mouth referrals um, is is off the charts. It's probably, I'd, I'd, I'd hazard a guess, it's industry leading in terms of the amount of referrals people give to us. Um, uh, We've got a growing and engaged customer base. Um, it's not just the millennials who have been at the forefront in the last 12 months. We have a, a wide variety of clients and where one thing we've done in our uh, research recently is to, to understand various sectors of clients and what each sector wants. And that's the investment that we'll put in and make sure that it's um, uh, giving everybody what they want right across the platform. I'm going to stop now, Mark, and um, I'm sure you've got a few questions there. Uh, I'll do my best. That's we'll go on to the next slide if you like while we're doing that. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me just move to the next slide quickly. One second, Rob. 
uh, there we go. Uh, the contact details, great. Um, I, I know you've touched on it already. Um, in terms of improving the, the user interface, um, what kind of things should people kind of expect in there? Is it, is it really around the news feed or is it going to be a complete kind of new look and feel and kind of easier navigation in terms of that 50% technology development? Yeah, look, um, uh, look, user experience has just got to be a continual improvement. Um, we're a very uh, simple platform to use. Um, we uh, allow, our, we have great feedback on on the 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 user experience we've got now. But things like um, things, you know, I mentioned live pricing and instant instant payments. You know, if you 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 want to be able to. Uh, if you see that stock that you've been wanting to buy and it suddenly has a down day and it gets hits your target level and you've got to you've got to wait until the next morning to get your money in, into the account that's 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 very frustrating and we know that and we understand that um, and we've just been working with the banks to make sure that um, we can do that within our own structure those sorts of things um, they will happen and they will make a big difference but in terms of um, uh, it's making uh, it, building on our user experience that's already there. Um, you know, uh, there will be. Um, we've hired a lot of um, UX people to. When I say a lot, we've, we've put we put people in that we didn't even have in there. So there's areas now that are getting attention that weren't getting attention, uh, and and I think everyone will see that um, come to the fore uh, even more over the over the next few months. Okay, and I know the last time you were on, Rob. Um... Uh, was in that kind of March quarter, there was uh, some issues or concerns raised about, you know, people getting accounts set up just based on the sheer volume of, of new accounts opening. Uh, and you said you were looking to try and add uh, capacity there. Has that largely sorted itself out now? Yeah, that that has, Mark. Um, you know, we returned to our normal service levels um, two or three months ago. And um, I think everyone will understand um, if they've been watching us closely that uh, that those problems have been solved. Um, it was a it was a good problem to have in some respects. Um, uh, we couldn't we did launch the US and uh, we did prepare for that, um, expecting to have our usual um, rates of you know, we have a very good straight through processing rate uh, for new applications, but um, some applications do need to be assisted. Um, what we didn't expect was that GameStop event um, just after we've launched and um, social media all around the globe pointing everyone, uh, go and join Self Wealth. They're the only platform that hasn't gone down. They're the only platform that is allowing you to, to buy the stocks you want, you, you want to buy and not um, prohibiting you from trading certain stocks. So we had a, we had a massive rush um, and it took a while to, uh, we were overrun there for a little while. Um, we've always had um, incredibly high uh, client service scores. Um, if you go through all the, um, uh, the referral sites, you'll see that. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure we're back to those levels now. We have, we have added resources. We're obviously part of that um, uh, investment spend over the next 18 months. We realise we're going to continue to grow uh, and we're going to need um, you know, to add where necessary on that client service side as well. And then one final question. I know the superhero guys have launched, you know, zero dollar US uh, equities, and um, they, they seem to be launching a new product every day or a new a new service every day. Um, in terms of dynamics within the market, is it a case? Of, you you know, you talk about the the seventy percent. Uh, by the banks is it a case of there there's enough kind of market share there for everyone that you know it's not going to be a winner take all between you uh, and the superhero guys or the easy equities guys uh, is 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 that the way to look ahead yeah yeah good good question mark um look you can you can look at it in many ways um the investment spend that we're making um is is there because we want to stay well ahead of all of the new competitors. Um, we have a, a, a big head start um, and we don't want them catching up to us. Um, we have a, a business model that we believe is a better business model um, and we are absolutely committed to that. We know our clients are committed to it as well. That's why they keep joining around about a thousand a week. Uh, and uh, we're sure that we will be um, leading from the front in terms of grabbing those bank accounts. Now, 
Uh, yes, is the, if if seven if we if we divvied up seventy percent amongst um, all the challenger brands, um, I think um, everybody would be happy to get a, a good percentage, and everyone would have a good business. But um, we are um, make no doubt about it. Um, we we've moved on from being a challenger brand now. Um, we are right in amongst it with them, with the big banks, and we're we're dishing it up to them on many fronts. And this increased investment over the next 18 months is going to allow, allow us to um, just increase the, the, the churn away from banks to us. Um, it's already, um, we're already market leading in, in that regard, um, but we're gonna push, push, push it to the banks a lot harder over the next 12 months. Hey, Rob, we're just up on time there. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much for, for coming back on and giving us a, an update and we'll definitely be uh, watching all the developments over over the next uh, couple of months over fy22 and i do believe our next presenter yeah mark uh, thanks is, everybody yeah thanks rob uh, mark is standing by so i'm just going to quickly stop sharing this presentation and mark uh, who's joining us all the way from california mark if you want to start sharing yours uh it's coming up now and yeah there we go you ready All to right. go when you are mark thank you very much i i definitely appreciate being invited today and i'm mark schneider the co-founder president and ceo of zebit and i'm certainly excited about sharing a little bit about zebit's mission our model and our results um, with the participants on the call today so in the next 20 minutes, I'll share a brief overview of the business. I'll give you uh, a perspective on our recent financial performance as we um, just ended our 12-month prospectus forecast, which ended on 30 June 2021. And then I'll give you an outlook for what we're doing around the next half of this year. And just to remind everybody, our calendar year is our fiscal year, and then we'll open it up to questions. So Zebit is a mission-driven and a purpose-driven e-commerce company. So we make our money off of selling products and services, the difference between the cost of goods sold and what we price it at. But we are providing a buy now, pay later service to US credit challenge consumers by giving them the ability to shop across 25 different product verticals and a reasonable time period, six months, to pay that back with no interest, fees, or penalties of any kind. So we are a white hat offering that is really targeting uh, a massive customer segment of about 120 million US consumers who for the last 40 plus years have been excluded from mainstream credit. In the United States today, we have about 74% of the population that lives paycheck to paycheck and barely gets by. And we have almost 50% of the population that either has no credit score as defined by a FICO score or has an impaired credit score, which does not allow them to get cost-effective credit. So these are not the consumers that are using a firm and afterpay and sezzle, et cetera, as a payment mechanism. Uh, they're actually relegated uh, toward predatory product financing alternatives. In the United States, we have rent-to-own, lease-to-own, installment loans, payday loans um, that cost a consumer 200 to 400% over retail just to buy a limited selection of SKUs across electronics, furniture, and appliances. This industry is, is incredibly ripe for disruption. Last year alone, uh, in 2020, the Financial Health Network reported that there were $123 billion of interest fees and penalties, with over $20 billion of that just charged with non-sufficient funds and overdraft fees for merchants trying to take money out of people's accounts. Uh, to this consumer segment. So nobody is serving it. Uh, there is no competitive force other than Zebit. And this is why we were founded in 2015, to really disintermediate and disrupt and give a fair value proposition uh, to half the population um, to allow them to buy what they need and pay over time. We've raised about $75 million of US capital uh, 24 and a half million US in our IPO that we successfully completed in October of last year. Uh, we also have a debt facility with Bastion uh, that gives us a line up to $35 million that we'll talk about that we use to fund orders. We have an incredibly experienced management team uh, and board that is skilled in not just uh, e-commerce, but also lending and credit risk 
uh, and then disruptive models. So again, we are an e-commerce company with our own proprietary buy now, pay later solution. We do service the credit challenged individuals. And the way in which we do that is we have built our own big data set and our credit models to be able to take a risky customer that if you give this customer a $1,000 cash loan in lending in the United States, typically half of them wouldn't pay you back a penny. And we have transformed them over the last five to six years into lower risk, heavy repeat shoppers. And I'll give you a little bit of the highlight around that and the proof point uh, to this model. So we acquire all of our customers digitally online. We underwrite them uh, instantaneously in about 90 seconds to two minutes uh, using proprietary data sets and advanced analytics. Once somebody is underwritten, uh, they have uh, the access to what we call the Zebit Marketplace, where they can shop just like in any normal e-commerce store uh, across 120,000 different active SKUs at any one time. And we have a 100% dropship model, which contains about uh, well over 100 suppliers across electronics, furniture, home, fragrance, tires, beauty. We can finance vacations, hotels, et cetera. And so we don't have any of the gross margin eating activities that a normal e-commerce company would have, which is buying inventory in advance, storing it, uh, making it obsolete by selling it at a discount and trying to get rid of it. Um, we have removed all of that uh, to be able to be streamlined in terms of uh, how to acquire a customer and how to underwrite them uh, given the credit risk. Now, as a customer is going through our, our shopping site, we actually are the only company that I know of, uh, at least in the United States and probably the world, that is doing real-time underwriting with machine learning models at our own point of sale that really determine whether we take the order and ship it or do we reject the order or not based on the expected uh, credit loss. We'll talk in a second about how we effectively use equity capital in building this business by arbitraging uh, the down payment at checkout that every customer makes with the supplier terms that we have and the low cost debt facility that actually funds 90% of the remaining COGS over time. We'll go through an example in, in two slides. One of the key parts of our business is this is not a one-time shopper. This is not somebody that uses, you know, uh, comes in, orders once and, and never we never see them again. We are clearly capturing the share of wallet uh, and high repeat engagement over now plus five years of tenure. And we reward our customers, not by threatening to uh, harm their um, already impaired credit score, but saying that if you pay us back on time every time, it's a collaborative effort, we will lower the down payment at checkout, give you access to more products and services, increase your 0% credit line, um, and actually customers over time de-risk themselves. So what do I mean by this? On the right-hand side of, of the PowerPoint presentation, Yes, as we're bringing customers in and we're using our data science models to better understand identity and fraud and income and affordability and the risk of that customer and how much line we should allocate them in terms of a store spending limit and a down payment at checkout. There's a structural part of this business where the customer self de-risks themselves. So if you see on in this chart, a customer that's been with us who has paid off an order over six months to a year, their bad debt goes down by half. If you've been on the platform one to two years, you decrease again. If you've been on the platform for four years, you have bad debt that's in the 2% range. So as a customer continues to consolidate their share of wallet, making purchases on average $1,200, $1,300 a year with us, purchasing any, anywhere from five to eight times a year, paying off orders over time, we're actually generating more contribution margin on that customer as they continue to pay off orders. Um, and we'll show that in the results. So I talked about using equity in an efficient uh, manner. So we're not just funneling all of our equity capital into funding orders uh, as working capital. Let me give you a, a high level unit economics example, um, just to give you a flavor for how a transaction works. Once we acquire a customer, a customer can pay a down payment between 5%. Our best customers pay 5% on high gross margin goods like furniture, uh, fragrance, et cetera, uh, up to 35%, depending on the risk of that, that customer. The remaining portion that is not paid at checkout is then financed in equal installments over six months, according to that customer's pay frequency. Now, remember, we know where this customer gets their income, when they actually get paid, whether it's from a job or whether it's from 
uh, disability or being a veteran, et cetera. And we align their payments uh, owed based on when their income actually comes into their bank account. We have 30 to 45 day supplier terms before we actually have to pay a dollar of COGS to our suppliers because we're not buying inventory in advance and sitting on it. And we have a debt facility that covers 90% of the COGS. So in the example here, let's, for exemplar, a $1,000 purchase, 25% down payment at checkout with a 25% gross margin, uh, good, just for uh, example's sake. For a $1,000 product, we take $250 at checkout from that customer. By the time we have to pay our COGS in 30 to 45 days, I've collect, and this is a monthly example, but we could collect weekly two times a month or every other week, but just for presentation purposes, we'll use a monthly example. I collect another $125 from that consumer. So I have $375 on the balance sheet. Now I have to pay my, my COGS. And the COGS for this $1,000 laptop example is $750. So I already have 375 from the consumer. Um, I need to fund uh, $375 uh, that I don't have. 10% comes from equity and 90% comes from an advance rate from the debt facility. As that burns down over time, uh, we basically have three months of cash at risk, which turns about four times a year. And as you get to the end of the six month product on a thousand dollar order, we've made $250 of gross profit. Um, and if you assume a 15% bad debt rate, which our bad debt is lower, you make about $150 uh, net profit on a thousand dollar transaction, which is a pretty enormous IRR and return on invested capital. So what we're doing here is we're arbitraging the cash flow between what we take from the customer, utilizing supplier terms and credit lines, using debt capital, which in this example only pay about seven or eight dollars worth of uh, interest fees on this transaction, uh, to fund the business and scale it over time. Um, and we could go into a lot more detail or questions about this you know, later if there are any. On a financial performance perspective, I'm really pleased after a year of being under prospectus forecast is, is to be able to report that we exceeded our, our 12 month forecast. So from an H1 perspective, we did 50 mil, $56 million of revenue. Remember our revenue is, the, is uh, revenue based on gross merchandise value. We are not a typical buy now pay later player that is taking a 1.8 to 2% commission off of total transaction value. Our revenue is booked like any other e-commerce company. So we did 56 million of US dollars in, in the first half of this year. Uh, we beat perspective forecast uh, by a million dollars. Our bad debts came in um, 100 basis points lower than the prospectus forecast. And our contribution margin was slightly off by 100 basis points. And we'll talk about why. But in the US, now that we have opened up the economy and we have, um, and I apologize for the Australian participants, we have you know, more and more of our uh, residents getting vaccinated, but not all, there's a big pent up demand for travel and vacations. And we'll talk about the products that we sell and, and, uh, and how we actually funded a lot of those vacations for our consumers. On a 12 month basis, uh, we came in six and a half million dollars above our prospectus forecast, which is about 6%. Uh, bad debts uh, or credit losses came in um, uh, at 10.9%, uh, which is pretty amazing as you're looking at, uh, you know, the performance over time or 380 basis points below, and then contribution margin came in at 210 basis points above prospectus forecast. So I would say that you know, we committed to investors going into an October IPO. Uh, we gave a 12 month forecast in probably the most extreme uh, case of ambiguity that anybody's seen around the globe. Uh, and we delivered on that prospectus forecast quarter over quarter uh, and met uh, investor expectations. Now on the next slide here, we're, we're just showing you a little bit of quarterly revenue on the left-hand side. Um, wanna take you through, uh, you know, as we were founded and went into production in 2017, you could see the quarter over quarter growth, which is pretty hefty uh, uh, over time. As we came into 2020, we we're actually scheduled to do our IPO in March, but then COVID hit. And so we lost line of sight to a capital raise. And I think this is also a testament of how we run the business. We had to maximize our cash flow in order to get to another capital raise, which um, I'm very appreciative happened in October of last year. Uh, but what we did there was we stopped investing in new customer acquisition growth. We cut demand by two thirds. 
we raised everybody's uh, down payment at checkout to 35%. We limited the SKUs. Uh, and what, what did that do at the end of the day? It, it did maximize cash. It uh, uh, increased contribution margins, lowered bad debts. And it's, it's kind of a testament to what our business will look like, uh, not from a demand perspective, but from a performance perspective, as we break the plane of profitability, uh, hopefully by the end of, of next year, uh, as we have more and more tenured customers contributing. Now, after October, we released the constraints and started to invest heavily in marketing acquisition. And as you can see, we had a phenomenal fourth quarter you know, taking a business down for uh, nine months out of the year and then reigniting marketing to have a, a record $44 million U.S. Uh, quarter uh, with a $22 million December uh, is pretty phenomenal. And then we came into H1 uh, with equally strong growth in Q1 and Q2 uh, to beat perspective forecasts. On the right-hand side of the equation, uh, you could see we did $56 million in H1. Uh, we are reaffirming our guidance to the market that we put out in our AGM meeting that we'll do 140 to $150 million of US revenue this year alone. So over the next six months, uh, from July all the way through December, we'll pretty much do an equal amount that we did in 2019 or 2020, but it's consolidated in six months. So we'll do anywhere between 84 and $94 million of incremental revenue over time. Now, I just want to be wary of comparing any kind of quarters to 2020, mainly because of the dynamics that I described to you. Uh, there's inherent bias in, in doing any of those comparisons. So revenue uh, has really been driven by a mix of tenured customers, especially during the cash constraint period. But as we got into Q4 and then Q1 and Q2 of this year, and with the reignition of marketing, we see a healthy dose of new customer orders in terms of our revenue. So as you can see in H1 20, we barely acquired you know, any customers as we shut acquisition down 47,000. Uh, in the second half, we reignited marketing mostly at the, uh, at the back half right before um, uh, 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 Q4. And then in H1, we acquired uh, 196,000 more incremental customers. Now, we, we do take a deliberate approach. I mean, my background is 30 years of being an operator and 15 years being in e-commerce and fintech, uh, running $100 million loan portfolios out of the UK, as well as starting and, and building this product business. And the way in which we think about things is we're always thinking about two, three, four, five moves ahead. So the channels that have gotten us here, you know, Facebook, paid search, some B2B channels that have been healthy for us. We've been deliberately reconstructing our marketing channels going into Q4 and especially H1 in order to continue to sustain 70% year over year or more growth in revenue. And to do that, you have to test new channels. So we've been testing TV, digital billboards, radio, uh, WhatsApp, building out an affiliate network with Rakuten, doing direct partnerships, and really diversifying uh, how we acquire customers. And this takes time to not only invest, but optimize. And everything we do is, is based on analytics. Uh, but I think we're well prepared with a healthy mix of channels in order to really continue to scale this business over time. And that also includes heavy disruption in channels that a lot of companies in the US and elsewhere are facing in terms of acquiring customers in Facebook with iOS 14, and the inability to really attribute uh, your marketing dollars to the user given uh, you're defaulted into that um, Apple device uh, by not sharing your privacy data. We've already uh, have workarounds related to that, and we're reinvesting in Facebook this quarter by having different APIs that give us attribution so we know the return on investment of every dollar we spend in all of the audiences that we invest in. As I said, bad debts, the shaded portion is sort of the cash constraint. Bad debts were at historic lows. And the key is there, there happens to be a big focus on bad debt, right? Because you have a credit challenge consumer um, that I know Australian investors don't necessarily understand as well because you don't have that consumer in a ubiquitous fashion across your economy. But this is a big portion of our economy. Now, there is an optimal level of bad debt over time uh, in this business. And the key is if we constrain demand, we can get bad debt really, really low and get contribution margin really high. But our focus is growing and having an optimal level of bad debt by bringing people into the cadre, getting them through that graduation phase of paying off an order in full, and they naturally lower their bad debt over time uh, and also governed by improved models. 
So on the half year basis, as I said, we beat the bad debt prospectus by, by uh, one percentage point, and we handily beat the 12 month prospectus. Now, some of you might be focusing your attention on Q2 and the 15.3% uh, of bad debt and thinking, wow, something's wrong with the business. Uh, there is an accounting adjustment from prior periods. And let me explain for just one moment. We actually, in the month that we record revenue, have to estimate bad debt. And this is a six-month product, and bad debt doesn't fully mature until uh, nine months out from any month. But according to GAAP, we have to estimate a reserve. Now, during COVID, what we call the order static pools or the bad debt curves have different slopes over time. And so as we're doing a reserve, estimating it, raising it, or lowering it, or releasing it, if those curves change over time, uh, we're forced to recognize in the months uh, that we realize that. And in Q2, there is a 1.8 percentage point or 180 basis points, about a little less than $150,000 that was allocated to Q2. The underlying performance, if you take that out, uh, in the US, I would typically show you a pro forma, reallocate that bad debt back to other quarters, which would just make them a tiny bit worse, but still exceeding prospectus forecast, obviously. Uh, that bad debt number would have been 13.5%, which is still below prospectus forecast and very much in line with our expectation as we continue to grow the consumer base. Now, contribution margin is a function of uh, the products we sell and expected bad debt. And I look at bad debt simply as a cost of acquisition. Again, uh, uh, we were a little bit under relative to H1, one percentage point, but overall we were 210 basis points uh, uh, exceeding contribution margin on $115 million of, of US revenue. And again, the underlying performance on a Q2 basis uh, would have been 12.4% uh, had the bad debt adjustment not been allocated to, to Q2. From an outlook perspective, um, we put out guidance and really just putting out guidance on a revenue range uh, as we're going into the second half of our fiscal and our calendar year. Uh, and we reaffirm that guidance as we're in the first month of, of six. Uh, and really, we are, um, we are a seasonal business. Uh, unlike other e-commerce companies that kind of die off during Q1, Q2, Q3, we have a steady state business, but our Q4 could be three to four times the size of any other non-peak quarter. Um, and so you could see we did you know, a massive amount of revenue in Q4 of last year, and, and we would expect um, growth on that uh, going into Q4 of this year as well. So what are we really focused on? We're a very operationally driven business with the customer at the center of everything we do. Um, we are optimizing existing acquisition channels. That means continuing to drive the cost of acquisition down, increasing approval rates. Uh, and how do we do that? We add better data to our underwriting. Uh, we just added another alternative credit score that should give us a 500 basis point minimum increase in approval rates, which lowers your cost of acquisition uh, as we test uh, new channels and we're expanding B2B partnerships as I, as I talked about. Uh, we are actually rolling out our, our first mobile application. We call it a mobile wrapper. We're, we're going to put that in the uh, uh, Apple Store and the Google Play Store. And we're really testing their acquisition as well. So if we can advertise in, in those forums, can we acquire people who download the app versus using our mobile responsive website? And about 95% of our customers use mobile devices already, uh, as well as putting in a new email retention and refer a friend program um, to continue to drive acquisition. We're always focused on credit modeling. So what we do best is not just have a streamlined e-commerce uh, supply chain. That's sort of entry to the game. What we have, which nobody else has, which is our competitive differentiation and our secret sauce and six years of a head start, is um, we don't use interest fees and penalties to supplement bad underwriting, right? We have figured out the signal of how to acquire customers cost effectively, give them the right line and write down payment, graduate them through the product through a reward system and build data science models that govern what we ship and what we don't ship. Uh, and also models that talk uh, about how much, how often to whom do we give line increases to. Um, so we're always working on, on our data science capability because that's the core of what we do. And then we're also expanding our catalog. Uh, we are entering um, new product verticals. We have beta tested uh, grocery uh, with a Unilever subsidiary. Uh, we're in negotiations with um, Box.com to add uh, thousands of SKUs to that category as well. 
Uh, we have signed deals to increase our, our home furniture and appliance selection. Uh, and then we also are bringing on, I didn't get to say, but we not only sell physical product, but we're the only company that I know of in the US that has the ability to finance virtual product. So we can capture the full share of wallet to our customer um, over time. And sorry about that. And so, you know, really wrap it up. I mean, I think we have an extremely powerful investment thesis. I mean, not only have we come into an ambiguous time inside of the Australian market and hit all of our key metrics on a 12 month prospectus basis, but look, we are an ethical company. We have a big social mission to change the way people get access to credit that no other company has touched in the United States. So while a lot of you are seeing a lot of movement and action and buy now, pay later, with Apple coming in and, 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 and the Goldman Sachs relationship and Affirm and Klarna and Afterpay and QuadPay and Sezzle, uh, et cetera, they're all focused on the same consumer base. They're expanding their models into interest-based uh, installment loans, and they're moving ge uh, geographically out to, to be able to take share away from each other. And I have a lot of respect for those models. We are not a payment mechanism. We do not make, you know, 1.8% commission off of, of, off of our uh, transaction value. We are a merchant. We are solely serving an untapped massive market where we've developed the data science capability to monetize that customer. We have built an extraordinary brand where a customer does consolidate their share of purchase and gets rewarded for that. We have a huge head start uh, and we're on a phenomenal growth track uh, and on a path to profitability to where the only thing that really stops us is our access to continued capital markets, to continue to fund the business and get it to scale. So we're extremely excited. We're a very mission-driven company. Our talent pool actually reflects that from a diversity, ethnicity, et cetera, perspective. Uh, most of our, my employees uh, are our customers and I myself have, have gone through uh, uh, that path as well in growing up. So we understand this customer, we understand what this customer needs, and we're trying to be a white hat offering. And we look forward to anybody that wants to continue to participate, you know, from an investor perspective. If you have questions, I, I invite you to contact our IR, uh, Victoria, at the um, email address below, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, cheers, Mark. I'm going to maybe kick off questions, one or two here, while we wait for some to come into the audience. Um, if we just look at bad debts for a second, uh, when they do arise, do you have a team internally that chases that so that you capture the data firsthand in terms of how you can track these people down and, you know, what the propensity is to recover it? Or do you, you know, just sell your bad debts book to one of the, you know, bad debt uh, collection agencies and, you know, you get your like five cents on the dollar. I'm just wondering how that works when it, when it, when it comes up. No, that's a great question. So we don't sell our debt because we're a merchant. We operate across all 50 states. Uh, we're under a very, very stable uh, regulatory structure. And so we do not sell our debt at all. If somebody goes delinquent, um, we, we have a transactional set of emails that gets sent out to them. The platform automatically freezes their spending limits so they can't finance any additional purchases. If they log in and they pay or cure, they get their spending limit back with no questions asked. We don't do anything like generating revenue off of saying, hey, do you want to delay your payment? You know, give us $10, $20. That's not an income stream. That just shows more volatility in that customer base. And we don't charge any fees or penalties. So the first line of defense is we have an internal collections team that reaches out by phone and email to try to get customers back on track and do it in a healthy way, which is you're never going to get, probably in our lifetime, access to a 0% credit facility that grows with you if you just shop in a responsible way and pay, pay back on time. And so don't lose this. This is not one of those predatory alternatives. There's no gotchas in this value proposition. And so we use healthy mechanisms to try to get people on track. And if they cure, they get their, their, their spending limit back. If somebody goes 90 days without payment, we write them off from an accounting perspective. We have a third party that collects on our behalf and recovers anywhere from 10 to 15% of outstanding, you know, written off amounts, uh, and they get paid a, a commission on that. But we don't sell our debt. Uh, we follow a very brand-focused way to treat this customer with integrity, 
uh, all the way through the process, uh, whether they pay us or they don't pay us, um, because we're building a brand that's very different than anything else that's been built for this massive customer segment in the US. Great. And then another one, I know you mentioned it, uh, I think it was slide 14, the expanded products. In terms of the 25 verticals you have and new ones that you're moving into, I mean, is it informed by customer needs or are you trying to, you know, just get uh, as broad a selection of offerings uh, as possible so you can kind of attract as large an audience as possible? I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of how you decide on these verticals and how new ones get added. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, so I'm not trying to be Amazon. I'm trying to be more like uh, Amazon for the underserved, but curated like Costco, right? So I have yes. different offerings. So I'm not trying to do 5 million SKUs here. No, everything we do is informed by, by data and, and, and analytics. And so we actually use the virtual product, the electronic certificates uh, to inform demand. And then we try to then convert that demand into physical product selection. So when we started the business, we were heavy e-certs, uh, selling about 80% of our revenue through, through electronic certificates to you know, financing other retailers. So if you want to go buy a pair of sneakers at Zappos, you can do that, et cetera, et cetera. And what we did was we built our product verticals based on really getting rid of those e-certs and putting in physical products. So as we have seen customers gravitate toward grocery, it's been an informed decision. And, and of course, we survey our customers, what do you want to see us sell? Grocery is a big part and buying in bulk is a big part. Um, and so that's why we're so focused on developing supplier relationships in those categories. Look, home, furniture, home improvement is also huge. So that's what we're going uh, to do next. And then our ability to really sell, and I've talked about this in, in other quarters, but large scale furniture that gets put on a truck. Uh, we haven't figured out the logistics math around that because we just don't have the volume, but now we have suppliers that are giving us um, fixed dollar values to ship you know, bedroom sets and dining room sets that are affordable uh, to our customer base. And that's where we're really driving in. We're driving into higher gross margin categories that really meet a full uh, life cycle event, whether you're a student coming out, you're a retiree living on a fixed income, you're a mother of three kids, a single mother, uh, or you just had a new baby, right? Uh, we want to be there, whether it's a stroller, whether it's, uh, you know, a 10 pound box of, of hamburger patties, or whether it's a, a laptop for your kid at school, we want to be there for, for every occasion. And then uh, another question would be, in terms of as the as the platform grows, are you or maybe you're seeing it already? Your ability to leverage scale to garner uh, you know better pricing from the suppliers, given how much uh, you know trade and volume that you're channeling to them, have you started to push that button as yet? Or or yes. do you, yeah okay. So there's yeah, potential no, to mean, expand I mean, the margin over time as you kind yes. of leverage volume with suppliers. Exactly. And it's not just suppliers. So we, we're now getting COGS rebates back on every dollar we do in electronics. We get 3% COGS rebates there. Uh, we are with scale. Scale brings, brings everything. We're getting uh, our data costs go down, our transaction processing costs to collect money uh, or repayment goes down. And of course, you get supply chain power by driving volume and getting, uh, whether it's promotional dollars or real rebates, but better COGS to be able to get better pricing for customers over time. Are we big enough yet? Uh, no, but are we already garnering some of that? A absolutely. I think as the more capital we drive into this business to acquire more customers, graduate them through the funnel and generate more repeat revenue. This is like a subscription model because our customers buy from us over and over again, building the book of business, de-risking that revenue. Uh, we just have to grow bigger and grow faster. And that's, that's our objective. Yeah, great. Mark, we have, I uh, haven't even realized we've slightly ran over time. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and for joining us. Uh, I know it's quite late afternoon, uh, your side in California. Um, 
just a note for everybody, the recording of this morning's event will be up on the YouTube channel on Monday morning, uh, probably around 9, 9.15. And if you want to watch this back or one of the early ones, if you just joined us for Mark's presentation, uh, you can do so on the YouTube channel. And with that, I'll end the event and wish everyone a good rest of their Friday.